In the uh, next unit here, under internal business environment, we're going to look at equal opportunities. So if we have a wee look at the learning intentions, it's to define the terms discrimination and equal opportunities, to identify and outline features of equal opportunities legislation, and in particular, we're talking about the Equality Act of 2010 here, and to give examples of actions that can be taken by employers to allow equality in the workplace. So let's have a wee look, first of all, at a definition of discrimination. Discrimination means treating people differently because they have certain characteristics. It can occur in different walks of life, for example, at work, in education, even if you are a consumer. Um, and here at the bottom are some of the protected characteristics that we talk about. Here's disability, age, race, gender and religion. So now looking at a definition then of equal opportunities, clearly discrimination is about treating people differently. So equal opportunities means giving all citizens an equal chance. For example, in relation to employment opportunities as a learner, as a consumer, making sure that everyone gets the same chance, no matter um, what any of the protected characteristics are. So the Equality Act of 2010, you would have studied this back in the higher course, uh, and we looked at this under HR um, as a piece of legislation, quite an important piece of legislation that businesses really have to abide by. So the Equality Act of 2010 basically consolidated, consolidated sorry, simplified, updated and strengthened previous anti-discrimination legislation in the UK. Now, I think you're going to be quite surprised here when you see the different acts that are now under this umbrella of the Equality Act of 2010. We had the Equal AP Act back in 1970. This was as a result of the Ford workers in Dagenham, female workers doing the same or broadly similar work to men, being paid differently. And they won their case. And the result of this was the Equal Pay Act. We've also got the Sex Discrimination Act, discriminating against people because of their gender, um, race relations because of the colour of their skin or their ethnicity. Um, Disability Discrimination Act, a bit more recent, 1995, where people um, it stops people being discriminated against because they have some form of disability. The Employment Equality, Religion or Belief Regulations, this was in 2003. So once again, homing in on people being equal in terms of religions or uh, religious or religion or religious beliefs. The uh, Sexual Orientation Regulations of 2003, because we have um, a number of different uh, genders uh, nowadays, then we have to be careful that we are not discriminating against people because of their sexual orientation. Um, the Employment Equality Age Regulations can't discriminate against someone because uh, of the, the age that they are. Tends to be uh, towards older members of the public, discriminating against people because, and because they're not going to get a job because of their age, or they're only be able to do certain work because of their age. So this is what this uh, legislation brought about equality in that front and it, it, the Equality Act obviously had been updated as well as this being updated as well with sexual orientation. These acts are changing all the time because life is changing all the time and it's really important that the Equality Act is constantly updated to uh, uh, adhere to these. So who's protected from discrimination then? Under the Equality Act, it's unlawful to discriminate against a person with protected characteristics. Now, some of these protected characteristics we saw in a slide before, but here is a wee list of some of them. Gender, whether it's male or female, uh, for example, marital status, for example, married or single, age, uh, discriminating against someone because they're perhaps too young or someone because they're too old. Disability, is it a physical disability or is it a learning disability? Race, it could be your colour, the colour of your skin, it could be your ethnic origin, religious beliefs or, or perhaps a lack of belief. Pregnancy and maternity, people being discriminated against because they're pregnant or because they are actually uh, on maternity leave. And these are all different protected characteristics. So different types of discrimination now. You've got direct discrimination um, and an example of this would be an advert asking for a young, motivated woman discriminates against men and older people. So that's direct discrimination. You're literally just putting it out there. Discrimination by association, an employee being refused promotion because it might be they're a carer for a disabled, a disabled parent. So the discrimination is not necessarily against them, but discriminating against them because of someone they are associated with. 
Another example is discrimination by perception, refusing to employ a candidate because they look like they follow, for example, a particular religion based on their clothing. Or it could be they perhaps look because they've maybe got piercings or tattoos and they maybe look um, threatening or whatever. It's people's perceptions of them. And you've got indirect discrimination. Uh, and this is a condition that all staff, for example, must wear skirts, discriminates indirectly, I suppose, against men. So these are all examples. Now, employees have got the right to complain about behaviour they feel is discriminatory or if they've been unfairly harassed. So harassment is where um, there maybe are jokes, jokes are being told, negative stereotyping, hostile acts or thoughtless comments. You know, for example, saying to a woman, what are you doing at work? You should be in the kitchen or something like that. This will inflict emotional stress on employees as well as lowering their morale and reducing productivity at work. So harassment is where a woman feels perhaps because of the way she's dressed, she's being harassed. People are making comments about her, or it could be that because you are a female and you know you get these sort of negative comments or jokes or whatever. Victimisation, however, is when somebody is treated badly because they have made a complaint or grievance under the Equality Act. So people may be picking on you as a result of you making a complaint because someone has discriminated against you, and that is what we call victimisation. So this next slide shows some examples of discrimination in the workplace. And these are just examples, remember. So, for example, introducing measures for married employees that, that, that aren't available for people in a civil partnership. So saying you're having to be married. Now, at one point, this was the case in the police force where um, men had to be married or, or women had to be married to their partner. Female cops, male cops had to be married to their partner for the partner to receive any benefits, any of their pension benefits when they die. If they weren't married, then no benefits were received from, from the pensions of the cops, the police officers. So as I say, that would be seen as discrimination. You had to be married to receive them. Selecting a member of staff for redundancy because they have a protected characteristic. Redundancy is a really dodgy one and you've got to be really careful that you pick the people to be redundant based on proper criteria. You know. Is their job no longer required? How long have they been with the company? If they've not been with the company for a long time, then clearly it doesn't matter what protected characteristics they have, or if they've not, they're the ones who go. Failing to make reasonable adjustments for a disabled worker. Well, we know the Equality Act asks for this, and that's an example of discrimination. If people are in a wheelchair, don't have wide enough doorways to get through, don't have ramps, you're discriminating. Firing someone for making an allegation of discrimination. So if some, it should mean that people are allowed to speak up if they feel that they have been discriminated against. And firing them, sacking them, is not right it's a form of discrimination because they don't want them to speak up about it firing someone because they're a union member lots of organizations clearly have trade unions and there are union members among their staff and sometimes management are not fond of trade union members because they do cause quite a lot of hassle in the workplace regarding paying conditions etc and if you want to fire someone to get rid of them because they're a union member that's seen as discrimination unfairly rejecting a request for flexible working from a new parent so if the conditions fit, if everything else fit, the job can be done, there's someone to perhaps job share with, you can do the work at home, away from the office, then there is absolutely no reason why you should be rejected for flexible working, and that's discrimination if you are. So let's now look at equal opportunities at work. The Equality Act does protect employees against workplace discrimination in relation to a number of different areas. Now, this is where the questions that in the exam tend to home in. They tend to perhaps pick one of these and you have to be able to talk about what happens um, to, to contravene any issues uh, that recruitment and selection, for example, could bring about under equality. So it covers recruitment and selection, Dismissal, redundancy or retirement, terms and conditions of employment, pay and other fringe benefits, promotion opportunities, training opportunities and other facilities in the workplace. So first of all, with recruitment and selection, then how can organisations make sure that they are not discriminating and they are abiding by the Equality Act? Job adverts should never be gender specific now. Unless justified, job adverts shouldn't include age limits, such as young and dynamic or mature person. Obviously, there are situations where legal requirements are allowed, for example, working in a bar. 
It could also be the case, for example, in the first part about job adverts not being gender specific. It might be a part in a, a, a TV programme as an actor or an actress, and it might be that they have to be gender specific. But at other times, that's not allowed. Ensuring job adverts are placed to avoid indirect discrimination. Everyone should be able to see these. <clears throat> Everyone should be able to see these job adverts. Uh, application forms shouldn't discriminate against disabled people, so you should actually be providing application forms in Braille for people, for example, who are blind. Ensuring the organisation accepts overseas qualifications comparable with UK equivalents, so make sure that you open your jobs to everyone. Physical access should be considered for disabled people attending interviews and being tested making sure you're holding the, the testing area or the interviews in a suitable place for disabled applicants to be able to, to reach. And organisations can ask about candidates' health or disabilities at interview. Um, on the contrary, I suppose you could call this positive discrimination, where um, in a lot of application forms now you can actually tick a box to say you have a health um, issue or a disability. And at that stage, a lot of organisations automatically give you an interview. So that can always be regarded as positive discrimination. As far as terms and conditions of employment are concerned, equality law means that fair decisions should be made as far as who, when and how much time the employee is allowed off. So, you know, has the leave to be paid or unpaid, how you're going to record absences, all of these things have to be done fairly for everyone the same way. Procedures should be in place regarding flexible working requests to avoid discrimination complaints. So you have to make sure that that once again is done fairly as well and you don't pick on certain people and not give them the flexible working for a particular protected characteristic. Time off and adjustments should be made so that a disabled person can work without barriers. So it may be that a disabled person perhaps has to attend their hospital or physio or whatever it happens to be. They should be allowed to do that. You must give leave for gender reassignment. Pregnancy related absence must be given, a lot of appointments have to be attended, scans, etc., and they have to be given automatically. Communication should be made regularly with absent employees so, so they know what to expect when they return, so they're not coming back kind of cold turkey. You also have to be careful that you're not communicating with them as though you're trying to force them to come back to work. You're doing it as a kind of caring, kind of keeping them up to date type. Um, situation and phase return periods should allow absent employees to settle back into work so you should be allowed to um, maybe come back on a part-time basis for a certain length of time to get yourself back into the groove. As far as paying benefits are concerned businesses must make sure criteria for awarding payment doesn't discriminate against people based on their protected characteristics. Now this really means pretty much talking about uh, male, males and females um, and the, the result of the Equal Pay Act. So management should conduct an equal pay audit to ensure that jobs of equal value are being treated, are paid fairly across all employees. Now this is quite interesting because this brings up Glasgow City Council when for a very large number of years they had been paying men and women different rates men were being paid more than women for doing the same or broadly similar work. And a few years ago, maybe three or four years ago, Glasgow City Council ended up having to pay a serious amount of compensation to these employees for the number of years, female employees, I have to say, for the number of years they'd been underpaid. So as I say, it's really important organisations don't get themselves into that situation and they make sure that they've done an audit and they can check that the jobs, if they are the same or broadly similar, their employees should be getting paid the same. They should have a fair and transparent pay scale and benefit scheme, so employees should know where they're going as far as pay is concerned. They Developing a clear procedure for investigating complaints regarding payment and to handle them sensitively and in accordance with procedure. So if an employee feels that they are perhaps not being paid the correct amount for doing the same or broadly similar work, then these complaints should be dealt with sensitively. And to review any non-financial benefits such as health insurance and pension schemes to ensure they're not indirectly discriminating as someone may be not getting what they should be getting that other people in the organisation are getting. 
as far as training and promotion are concerned, training should be offered to women on maternity leave. So if a woman is on maternity leave and other employees in the organisation have been given training, then the female should be offered it. A reasonable adjustment should be provided so that training or promotion can be carried out. For example, offer on the job training rather than external training so to make sure that it suits people to be able to get their training. Similar to the selection measure, measures, uh, use a panel interview to avoid discrimination by perception. So some people might think someone doesn't really look the part, but they actually know their stuff and they would actually do really well in the job. And panel interviews help with that because more people can see through these. And to publicise promotion adverts to everyone and ensure the advert is accessible to all, it's really important the job is advertised so that it's available to everyone to see. As far as facilities are concerned, we're really talking about the physicals here. So modifying equipment for disabled staff members. We talked about this at higher. Ensuring there are changing facilities, toilets, etc. to cater for transgender or religious beliefs and disabled employees. So make sure that they are able to access changing facilities um, that are sensitive. Provide a quiet room for praying for people with religious beliefs. Provide fridges and storage for foods that need to be kept separate. For example, your kosher from your non-kosher foods. Taking account of dietary requirements in the canteen, making sure you're catering for all and providing breastfeeding areas for women who maybe have to you know, breastfeed their children at lunchtime. Perhaps someone's brought, a baby's brought to them to be breastfed. There has to be an area for, to allow them to be able to do that. As far as disciplinary, dismissal and retirement are concerned, disciplinary documents should be provided in different formats to help, for example, the visually impaired. Meetings should be in accessible rooming. An interpreter should be used for a deaf worker if required, so they, they know exactly what's been said. Before dismissing a worker, any reasonable adjustments that could mean a return to work should be considered. Job rotation or redeployment, for example, if the employee had a serious accident and they're in a very physical job. Before actually letting them go, is there anything you can do to, to relocate them, put them into a different job so they can stay employed? Don't force someone to retire. Remember, age now means you don't have to retire at when you reach a certain uh, or retirement age. You can carry on working and you shouldn't be forced to retire. It's discrimination to give a worker a poor reference on the grounds of the, any of their protected characteristics. So if someone is moving on to another job, then you've got to be very careful about how you, you um, create the reference and you can't pick on any protected characteristics, for example, a disability. Now, exceptions to the Equality Act, then organisations must prove they have a legitimate aim to defend certain discriminations and they must have taken proportionate means, looked for and not found alternative ways of achieving the aim. So what we're saying here is they really have to go out their way to make sure that they can um, they can defend why they're discriminating or there's a supposed discrimination. So examples of a legitimate aim could be the health, safety and welfare of individuals. Maybe someone is dis has a disability and they know that that's dangerous, maybe working with equipment or whatever, or they wouldn't be able to get out of a situation quickly enough. Uh, they've got to make sure that a legitimate aim would be running an efficient and profitable service. So if their service is going to suffer as a result of a protected characteristic, um, then it may be that the discrimination has to take place. And the requirements of the business, um, that doesn't just mean financial reasons. You can't say, well, we're not going to meet that um, person's uh, disability, for example, because we can't afford to put these, these measures in place. That's not allowed. You, have, you can't do that. Any other exceptions then are things like an occupational requirement. We talked about that earlier on with actors and actresses. Positive discrimination or a woman needed to fit bras and M&S. It would be quite uncomfortable for ha perhaps for a woman to have a man fitting a bra. Age, using payment rates based on age. If you think of minimum wage regulations, they're based on age. Uh, you go into a lot of jobs and you'll not be paid the same as more mature members of staff until you've actually done your time and you've worked up your way up. These things are exceptions. Other legislation, we mentioned underage people not being allowed to work in bars. And national security, for purposes of national security, protected characteristics can be taken into account. So perhaps maybe... Um, you know, it could be, for example, that certain religions or anything like that, they have to be really, really careful that, that countries are safe and um, that's a protected characteristic that has to be taken into account. As far as age regulations are concerned, the default retirement age has now been removed. As we say, there is no retirement age now. 
you can't actually force someone to retire at 60. It was for a woman and 65 for a man. That's gone. It means no employee can be forced to retire, providing they're still competent and capable in their job. Employers are more inclined to value the skills and experience of more mature workers and to provide training to upgrade their skills. These people have been doing the job for a long time, so they're probably more experienced and can teach the younger people a lot about their job. So it's quite good to be able to keep these guys on. Now we're going to talk about the glass ceiling. Now, this is a question that could potentially come up in the exam. And the term glass ceiling refers to the sometimes invisible barrier to success that many women and people of ethnic minorities, as well, I have to stress, come up against in their careers. Now, what is a glass ceiling all about then? Often it's male dominated workplaces have a masculine culture and it means that women are more likely to face gender discrimination than those in evenly mixed work places for example perhaps on things like a building site you might find women maybe put up with a bit more discrimination negative comments etc women tend to employ less well remunerated positions less senior roles and more part-time roles and that tends to be because women tend to spend more time at home looking after the kids which is once again um, something we just assume and it makes it difficult for them to, to reach the higher heights of an organisation. Women and men tend to be segregated into different industries and types of jobs. So women tend to concentrate on things like clerical, service, occupations and men are more in male dominated positions and at that things like engineers, surveyors, things like that and you tend to find women find it more difficult to climb the ladder in these professions. There are clear distinctions between the degrees chosen by men and women which lead them into different types of jobs leading to very much male dominated industries, industries just like I've said there with engineering etc albeit a lot of these jobs are now trying to be more positive and getting more women in and they're advertising for more women to join these careers even in highly female dominated careers such as public relations men have got an, an advantage of what they call the glass escalator effect and it's almost like they're rising to the dizzy heights very easily you don't really see it happening as in the glass part um, but they tend to be able to climb the dizzy heights simply because they're men. Although women earn more degrees, bachelor's degrees than men, they're less likely to be hired into entry level jobs, which means at manager levels there are significantly fewer women to promote from within, so they tend to go in further down the scale than into sort of like managerial jobs. So even though hiring and promotion rates improve at more senior levels, women really don't tend to catch up. Women have to provide more evidence of their competence than men. So to attain the same level, they maybe have to put more effort into it to actually prove themselves. Yes, I'm a woman, but I can do such and such. Women are more likely to be subjected to sexual harassment, which forces them to leave or not put their head above the parapet. Maybe they keep very quiet and they don't maybe want to move any further up the organisation because they've experienced this sexual harassment. Research has also found that women who don't conform to traditional feminine expectation by holding authority, not being heterosexual and working in fields dominated by men are more often the targets of sexual harassment. So women who actually um, don't want to do that tend to find they're sexually harassed. Women who maybe want to go out the, into the fields occupied by men. Another question you could be asked in an exam is about the impact of having a diverse workforce. And a diverse workforce means that you've got um, a large number of people with protected characteristics in there. An organisation should see an increase in creativity as every individual brings their own personal way of thinking and it leads to better decision making. An organisation known for its ethics or fair employment practices or appreciation for diverse talent is better able to attract much more and a wider pool of qualified candidates. By ensuring diversity is evident in all levels of the hierarchy, um, it might be that you actually gain recognition from independent organisations that you might deal with on a daily or weekly basis. Customers can relate to workers with similar backgrounds, culture, etc. And it can achieve like better trust or customer satisfaction. Utilising employees' understanding of cultural nuances can minimise that barriers to growth overseas. So being able to, if you do employ people from different cultural backgrounds, it makes it easier for you to go multinational and move into different countries with ease. Allowing employees insight to other cultures should lead to increased tolerance, mutual respect and better working relationships. And you'll find if you do that, there's reduced conflict and reduced complaints. 
A multi-generational working environment offers employees the opportunity, as we said earlier on, to learn from each other and become a more flexible workforce. People who've been in the organisation for a long time, they may be older, but they've got a lot of experience that they can share. And management now need to provide training and educate employees, which is actually costly and that's a negative impact, which is on the top of this page here. That shouldn't be on the last page. Other organisations may choose only to do business with companies who embrace diversity. So um, it puts pressure on companies to change very quickly or they know they're not going to get any business. There might be a difficulty in transitioning or changing. It's very, very difficult to change people's ways of working and their beliefs, etc. And that can um, be really, really hard. So it can cause a barrier. And as cultures collide, there might be a misinterpretation of meanings. What somebody might, might find funny to one culture may be disrespectful to another. So it could be like all the, the original old jokes about Irish people not having really having brains. Then that can be really disrespectful to people who are Irish. <laughs> um, and having issues like that in the workplace can be quite difficult. So these things can cause problems. Um, and this last slide here is really just a past paper question. Um, one potential past paper question in the class will have been given many more on different ones, explaining the steps an organisation might take to minimise the threat of prosecution under the Equality Act. And to be honest with you, those slides earlier on under training and promotion, facilities, dismissal, all of those things would be under this. Thank you very much.